Hello and welcome to this video on business continuity planning. So in this video we're going to look at what business continuity planning is all about, what is its importance, what are the types of disasters that uh, that can occur, what are the kind of business continuity plans or frameworks or methodologies that we can use and how we can overcome barriers to business continuity planning. So let's start by defining what business continuity planning is all about. In the process, we're going to define a disaster. So business continuity planning is a process that is used to identify and prioritize critical functions or critical services or systems in our environment and the threats that are likely to, uh, to affect those various functions. Business continuity planning is also a way of minimizing the impact of major disruption to normal operations. This is where the idea, uh, the issue of disasters come into play where with business continuity planning, we are trying to mitigate against the adverse effects of any disaster that could potentially occur for our business and in, and in our particular case to our IT systems. So with business continuity planning, we are trying to come up with a plan that helps us to continue functioning in the event of a disaster happening um, at our organization that could affect our IT systems. A business continuity plan is also a, a process to enable the restoration of as, um, assets as well as the restoration of normal business operations as soon as possible. So we can say BCP or business continuity planning is about identifying and prioritizing your critical functions. Then you find ways to minimize the impact of any disaster or major disruption to that function. And then you also look at how you can quickly restore that function back to service. Uh, or back to normalcy, as well as how you can quickly return all the all the assets of the business to normal functionality. So with BCP, in order for you to be able to identify the critical functions that need to be functioning at all times, come up with a plan of um, recovering the event of a disaster and how you can quickly uh, normalize operations, you need to come up with plans and procedures that you will use. Um, to be able to implement that business continuity plan. So this planning will involve looking at things like uh, your worst case scenarios in the event of a disaster. What's the worst thing that could happen to your business or to your IT systems? And how can you protect systems or your business against such um, an occurrence? You also, as part of planning, you also need to have funding for some of these um, BCP programs because some of the solutions will require you to either acquire new assets or to come up or to employ new people or to restructure your organization in some way. And we'll look at that as we go in this um, lecture. Now, as part of planning or defining your business continuity plan, you need to know how much time and how much data you can afford to lose in the event of a disaster. So there are some systems or some uh, functions where you can say, you know what, if this system is down for two days, it's not a problem to the organization. We can continue functioning. But there are some systems which cannot even afford to go down for even a minute, which need to always be up. For example, if you're an e-commerce business, your website always needs to be up. Okay. But if you are a hospital, your website does not always have to be up because usually most of your clients walk to the hospital, they come to the hospital. So you need to define the amount of time that you can accept to have the system down. Is it okay for us to have our system down for a minute, for two hours, for two days? So you need to accept that time. And that's where the recovery time objective comes in. So the recovery time objective is the point in time when you must have at least the critical aspects of a business operational game. So recovery time objective is basically defining the amount of time or the maximum amount of time that your system can be down. So this is basically the maximum amount of time. You can say, you know what? Our system can only be done for 15 minutes. After that, it should be working and servicing our clients. So recovery time objective will help you to come up with plans or, or business community plans that can help you adhere to your RTO. That can help you adhere to the maximum amount of time that you can actually allow your clients or your businesses to be affected. Then when it comes to the data that is in your systems or in your database, you also need to um, to define the um, maximum amount of data that you can afford to lose. So the maximum amount of data that you can afford to lose is defined by the recovery point objective. So with the recovery point objective, what you're saying is, in the event that my database becomes corrupted or I lose data, 
how much data can I afford to lose? Can I afford to lose data for 2,000 clients or for 20 clients? Can I afford to lose data for the past five minutes, which uh, data which has produced in the past five minutes, or can I afford to lose data which has produced in the past uh, two days or two weeks? So recovery point objective is basically saying how much data can you can you afford to lose either in terms of clients or either in terms of time? How much data from now going backwards can I afford to lose? Can I lose if I lose 24 hours of data? What what impact will it have on my operations? If I lose data of 10% of my clients, how much impact would that have on my operations? So that is the recovery point of objective. So as you define your business continuity plan. And as you think of that plan, you think of your worst case scenarios, you think of your funding, then you also think of how much you can, how much downtime you can afford as well as how much data you can afford to lose. So that when you're now coming up with the actual plan, you are planning something that will give you the intended results, even regard, regardless of which disaster occurs. So why do we have to embark on business continuity planning? We need to, to do business continuity planning because any disruption to a business any downtime to our systems or any loss of any revenue can lead to things like financial losses. So the business will lose customers or the, during the time it will not be operating, it will not be making any money. It will lead to regulatory fines. So if you violate your service level agreement, either which has been set by you and your regulator or between you and your clients, you can actually be fined for that. So you, you end up incurring even more, loss, more financial losses through fines. Business continuity planning also helps us to mitigate against damage to equipment. So if we have, if there is any damage to to our equipment, we can find ways to quickly either fix it or replace it without losing any uh, anything from without losing anything with which was either housed within that equipment or the equipment itself. Then there's also the the issue of time loss. If there is a disaster, we may lose a lot of time in the productivity of our work. So if we are a manufacturing company, we may realize that we may not be able to operate and hence we will, re we will reduce our productivity as a result of time loss. So BCP is important in order to mitigate against all these and more. There are many other things that could actually happen, but these are some of the pointers that we need to, to look at in order to see the importance of this continuity planning. Now, coming to the types of disasters, I think before there is the definition of a disaster. A disaster is an event or an unexpected occurrence that can seriously disrupt our operations and can have some long-term impacts on our normal way of operating as an organization. So some of the disasters that could occur, which, which require us to have a business continuity plan in place, include natural disasters like earthquakes and floods, hailstorms, ETC. So those can actually lead to equipment damage, can lead to loss of human life, which can impact our operations. There can be also issues of power failure. So if you're operating a data center, if you lose power to that data center, that means no one can access that information. And you also run the risk of actually losing that information due to data corruption. So power failure is another problem. Then there's also hacking, security breach. People, they could be corporate espionage, they could be um, illegal hacking, all those issues can actually lead to either the corruption or the loss of important or confidential data the organization. <clears throat> then a very huge part of uh, the disasters that okay is the human error. So you find that most of the disasters that are going to okay in an organization are going to okay mostly because of human error. And that can lead to things like equipment damage, data loss, security breaches, etc. So the human error can also lead to a, a very huge disaster in the organization. I'm sure if you research around, you'll find that there have been a lot of money lost or a lot of uh, damaged equipment as a result of um, human beings making some mistakes during their uh, operations. Some of these other disasters could be generator failures, which will lead to power failures or the IT equipment itself failing and leading to either downtime or actual loss of system functionality. So when we look at the business continuity planning, we should not look at business continuity planning as a project, but we should look at it like a process. So the reason why we have to look at BCP as a process is because 
the plan that we come up today may not be valid 10 months from now. So because of changes either in the operating environment or in the businesses processes or in the uh, product that we sell to our customers, there may be need for us to continually review our BCP plan so that we know which systems to prioritize. We re-evaluate um, our RTOs and RPOs and we also know which people are going to be important in the work that we do. So the methods that we're going to use for BCP are methods that should be uh, proven and certifiable. So business continuity is not supposed to be treated as a project, but rather like a process. Because as the operating environment changes or as the organizational processes and products and clients change, there's need for you to reevaluate and reprioritize your functions and come up with new parameters and new ways of implementing your business continuity plan. So you should always be treated as an ongoing project where after a certain amount of time you reevaluate uh, your BCP and see if it's still very relevant and if it's still effective. It also has to be based on proven methods that have been shown to be good for uh, for BCP and for, especially when it comes to IT where we have, we have got certain ways of making sure that our IT systems are resilient or they can recover from any disaster. So the plans should start in a simple way, come up with a very simple plan and then when you're now confident of your simple plan, then try to add more details to it until you get to a plan that is sophisticated enough to keep your business running but simple enough for everyone to understand what they are supposed to do and their role in that BCP. Then there's need for management buy-in. So management is supposed to provide the manage the governance of the BCP, that the ones that are supposed to play a huge role in making sure that the BCP is working. Therefore, they're supposed to take leadership and they're supposed to guide everybody else in how the BCP is supposed to be implemented. Now, as, as an example to BCP, there may be some questions that you have to think of as you plan your, your business continuity process. So you have to think of things like, um, there's some questions for, for a certain type of business. You have to think of things like, how will we continue communicating? How will our leaders commun communicate during this uh, disaster or during this uh, terrible occurrence? What are the protocols and procedures that we have put in place to make sure that communication is still there? How do we make sure that we still have all the contacts that are up to date and where should we meet? So in the event of a, of a building collapsing or an earthquake, where do we meet as a business? In the event of your systems collapsing, where, which one do we make our command center? Where do we, we have our command center which can coordinate all the activities of the organization? Then you also have to ask yourself, which of our business systems are critical? So a very key, key component of business continuity planning is prioritization of critical assets or critical function. There are certain things that you need to restore first before everything else. So you have to be able to uh, prioritize and know your critical processes or assets. You also have to ask yourself, how are you going to minimize risk in the current operations of the business as well as the future enrollment. So this one now is part of the BCB process where instead of waiting for the disaster to happen, you try to mitigate or to minimize its occurrence beforehand. Then you also have to look at what will happen to your in, uh, physical infrastructure. For example, if you lose your controls, your security controls and your alarms, ETC, you need to ask yourself uh, things like, what will happen if there's destruction of property? What will happen if we're unable to access communication systems a long time, how are we going to make sure that the system and uh, the organization can keep running without our usual communication system? So what you're basically doing is you're coming up with what if, um, and we're doing a what if analysis. We are looking at what if scenarios that could possibly okay and that could impact your business in, in, in one way or the other. Now, as part of prioritizing your critical functions in your business, one way you can do that is by using the business continuity risk matrix. So with the business continuity risk matrix, you are looking at the probability of an occurrence happening against the impact of that occurrence. Okay, so you want to say, what is the probability of our systems going down? And if they do go down, what is the impact that they will cause to our operations? So one area that you can look at is 
uh, some of the risks that you can have could be there could be low probability of occurrence as well as very low impact. So this could be um, I'm not sure which example to come up with here, but you could have uh, an occurrence that doesn't always happen. For example, people don't always die. Okay, that's one, and probably the impact of a certain person dying in your organization may not be so high. Well. I'm not saying uh, human life is not important, but there are some people whose roles can be easily replaced or the company can actually continue functioning without them. So that could be a low risk, a, a low risk occurrence. So that one, you can actually ignore it and attend to it as and when it happens, because the trailer of happens. Then you've got high probability occurrences, which have got low impact. So these, high, um, these occurrences with high probability of, of happening for example, things like account lockouts for human beings, I mean, for your employees, things like um, loss of loss of equipment, um, loss of a pen, for example, uh, things that, you know, that happen on your day-to-day -day work or on a day-to-day -day basis. And these things have got a low impact on your business. So these things, you just need to come up with normal procedures that people follow. For example, if you lock out yourself from the domain account, from your from your domain all you need to do is maybe call somebody who fits it for you or you just need to use a certain system and look it out and the like so you come up with a procedure this so so the high probability of having a low impact part is usually dealing with day-to-day -day, uh, business issues that happen then we've got things that have got a a low probability of happening but they've got a high impact on the business so these things are for example if you have your infrastructure being damaged, if you have, um, uh, let's say, losing a lot of your management at one time, um, maybe being hacked or your systems being hacked or something like that, the, the probability of that happening is quite low. It doesn't happen always. But when it does happen, it will have a high impact on your business. So for those things now, that's what we need to come up with a BCP for. So we need to plan for those things. Those are the things we develop a business continuity plan for. But if something has got a high probability of happening, that means it's always happening, and it has got a high probability, a, a high impact on the business, then that thing basically is killing your business. So for example, it could be um, you're always being hacked every day. Okay, so the probability of being hacked is high because you're being hacked every day. And the impact of that is that your systems are always down. So that means you need to change something. You cannot continue with uh, business as usual because it's continually and always interrupting your, bu your business processes. So what you need to do is to do something about it so that it moves from a high probability, high impact zone to the other three zones which you can have control over. So when you prioritize all these things or the critical functions and you know the risks that are most likely to affect you as a business, you also need to be able to manage the business continuity process. And that's where BCP governance comes into play. So you manage the BCP process by coming up with um, policies that can help you determine how you manage and control the risk that you find. You will come up, you will be able to also, you should also rather allocate knowledgeable personnel and sufficient resources to the BCP process so that you have the experts working on the process as well as you have enough um, resources allocated to it for it to be successful. You also need to make sure that the BCP process is reviewed uh, regularly so that it, it's always current and relevant. And you need to ensure that employees are trained and they're also aware of what they're supposed to be doing in the event of an invocation of the BCP process. So if if an outage does happen, what are uh, the employees supposed to do? Do they know what they're supposed to do? Do they know how they're supposed to do it? So you're supposed to make sure that happens. Then after you have the process, you also need to ensure that that process is being tested. So some things look good on paper, but when it comes to implementation, they're a disaster. So you need to always test your BCP processes and your BCP plan to make sure it's working fine. Now, moving on to some of the methodologies that we can use for uh, business continuity planning and for making sure that our business is resilient to some of these disasters, we can use this resilience framework. So as you can see with this resilience framework, the program governance or project management is the one that basically encompasses or controls how the whole methodology is used. 
So the program governance provided by management or project management provided by the project manager, whoever is the manager of the program, is the one who has total control over how we're going to either start the, the, the plan and also how we're going to eventually implement. So what we need to do, the first step is to analyze our current operating business environment, both external and internal. So we need to look at our current states and our current processes and see how they are like, what do, what, how do we currently operate, what are our current processes. Then we look at how we can reduce risk and or mitigate risk against those processes. So for example, by coming up with a risk assessment and mitigation uh, process, then we also need to do a business impact analysis. We look at in the event of um, something going wrong based on our BCP matrix, what is the impact of that thing to the business? So you, the first step is to analyze by looking at your current situation, looking at how you can actually protect your current processes from disasters, and also doing a business impact analysis. Now, after you've finished your analysis, you then move on based on the input in, on the outputs that you got from the analysis stage. You then move on to develop the BCP, uh, the business continuity plan. Now, as part of development, you need to come up with resiliency, availability, and recovery strategies. So resilience and availability strategies usually work before there is a disaster. So these ones are the ones that you try to, ha to have in place before the disaster is as mitigatory measures to the disaster. Then the recovery strategies are the ones you use in the event of a disaster actually occurring. So the activities now that you come up with to achieve this resilience, availability, and recovery will include things that will help you to have operational continuity. For example, um, making sure that your facilities uh, can be recovered in the event of a disaster. How do you recover from a infrastructural damage? How do you recover from equipment problems? How do you recover from a technological disaster? For example, it's a hack or data corruption. How do you recover in the event of loss of um, your employees, either they resign or God forbid they die? And also what happens in the event that your vendors or your third party partners do not come to the party to help you in your problem. So you look at, you come up with all these procedures and activities at this stage, which then you validate using a structured tabletop process. So simply a structured tabletop process is where people just sit down together and they look at what if scenarios and they test whether the system or the plan that they've come up with can actually um, withstand all those what if scenarios that have been come up, uh, come, uh, came up with. So after you've analyzed, as I said, you develop the plan. Now, when you have developed the plan yeah, and you're happy with it, you then move on to implementing the plan. So when it comes to the implementation stage, this is where you now buy equipment or you hire new people so that they can, in, so that this equipment can be used or these people can actually implement uh, this BCP. After you have those resources acquired and implemented, you then train people and bring awareness to them on what they're supposed to do, what their roles are, and how they are supposed to function in the event of the invocation of the BCP. Then lastly, you, you exercise and test. You practice the whole BCP process. You test whether your systems you've put in place actually work. You test whether they're actually going to, uh, to bring the system back to, uh, I mean, the systems or the business back to normal in the event of a disaster. Now, after all these tests, you you may find that you have, you may find some are inadequate or some irrelevant or some need to be tweaked here and there. So that's where the continuous improvement and quality assurance process comes into play. Where now after testing, you take all your outputs, then you bring them back to the analysis stage where you analyze them again, and then look at their shortcomings or their strengths. You refine your plan and then you implement it again, test it, and you start the whole process again. So the operational continuity part is the one that is covered under the BED3 uh, methodology. So this is basically, this BED3 is basically an expansion of this part of the resilience framework. And the tabletop exercise, as we spoke, as we said uh, before, this is basically an expansion of this stage, of the validation stage, where people are looking at, are sitting down and discussing and looking at the different scenarios which may have to which may lead to the invocation of the business continuity plan. So when we're looking at business continuity planning, it has got a life cycle. So the life cycle is 
Firstly, you're going to have normal operations. And during normal operations, that's why you're supposed to prepare for this plan. And you prepare by making sure that you have an actual plan that you can invoke in place. You have got your command center and people know what the, what's supposed to be happening there. You train and test your plan. You look at all those business impact analysis, awareness and risk assessments, which we did under the resilience framework. So that's the pre preparation stage. In the event of a disaster happening, then you're supposed to what? To respond to that disaster. That's why you look at what where your command center and what your command center is supposed to be doing, who is coordinating the various responses, and how are we are we what is our communication status in the sense that are we actually able to communicate and to what extent? Then after you have done, so when you are responding to the disaster, you then move to the part where you are now moving from result uh, from dis disaster um, uh, coordination or disaster recovery to re return to normalcy. So. It's not like you are going to move from when a disaster occurs, you're just going to first coordinate the disaster response and then all of a sudden you're back to normalcy. No, you're going to move back and forth usually between the response to the disaster as well as trying to get to normalcy as soon as possible. So as part of recovery now, you're looking at your business continuity plan being invoked to make sure that whatever it is that you were training, whatever it is that you put in place is now being done to make sure that you return to normal as, as soon as possible. You look at your current gaps after you have recovered your system. So probably you have prioritized certain systems. They're now up, but it doesn't mean that they are functioning as they are supposed to. So they may be working at a minimal level. So you start looking at the gaps, you look at the after action response, and then you take all the corrective actions to make sure that you can recover to normal as soon as possible. The operative term here being as soon as possible. So we are trying to do everything as fast as you can so that your customers, your suppliers, your whole value chain is not affected for a very long time. Once you've done that, you're always going to be moving around that life cycle of normalcy, response, and recovery. Preparing, responding, and recovery. So that's the business continuity uh, planning life cycle. So during this life cycle, as we say, the first one is during the prepared the preparation stage, there is the need for you to now do your risk assessment so that you know how you can mitigate all the risks that are that okay. Then in the event that the disaster does okay and you have it, if you failed to mitigate it, you then need to be prepared. And this is still the stage of uh, preparedness. In this life cycle, that's we are still at the prepare stage here. Then when the disaster does okay, you move to phase three, which is the response. You're basically responding to the disaster. Then on stage four, is the same on the life cycle is basically recovery so the key stages are being prepared response and recovery so mitigation and preparedness can be taken as one um, phase and response and recovery is the two other phases so you have all these brilliant ideas you have decided to come up with a business continuity plan what are some of the challenges that you can face in coming up with this plan okay that's what we want to look at now. What are some of these challenges? So there could be lack of BCP governance. There is no one taking leadership of this process. Management is not supporting you. Management does not know how to implement it. There is no one who is taking ownership of this project. So at the, at the end of the day, no, uh, the, the plan that you end up developing will be lackluster or it may not even exist at all. The other problem that you can have is that you can come up with, uh, with systems which you, can, which you want to implement, but these systems may not have been tested. So you have got a good plan, but you have not tested the system to see if it's actually going to. Then there's also lack of monitoring. You could, be, you could not be able to monitor whether the risks are increasing or decreasing, what is likely going to happen in the future. And as a result, whatever plan that you have developed may no longer be relevant by the time a disaster occurs. There could also be too much planning and lead to training and education. So you could plan and come up with a beautiful, beautiful plan, which is theoretical, but no one is really focusing on making sure that it is tested, it is working, and everybody knows what they are doing. And lack of executive support is the same as lack of uh, ACP governance. So we spoke of the resilience framework. So basically we can say, some of the barriers to successful BCP is not following the resilience framework. You are not doing your business impact analysis. There is a huge technology focus where you are, instead of focusing on the processes that the business is going to invoke 
that involve the people, the process, the process themselves, and the technologies. They're just focusing on the technologies. They're just saying, okay, you know what? Let's build a database cluster. Let's come up with a active actor. But you're not thinking of who is going to implement that. How do we invoke that? How do we make sure that is working? You also don't involve the business side. So this will be IT on its own saying, you know what? Let's just develop something that works. We're not actually consulting the business side or how it happens. So what could happen is IT could come up with a highly available system or a system that they can bring up in a very short time. But after they've brought it up, the system could be unusable for the end users. So there's need to involve the end users of the system in the BCP process so that they know and they also test whether the systems are going to work. Also, as alluded to earlier, the BCP plan will be led by operations personnel. Now, if it's led by IT people, they are going to just have an IT mindset towards the whole approach. But what we want is to have a holistic approach to the um, process. So we need to involve people from all sections in this process. The document could be too complex, too difficult for people to implement or follow. There could be no plan for reviewing and updating the plan, no training, as well as use of templates that have worked elsewhere may not be applicable in your own environment. Now, as part of some examples that you can use as an IT uh, personnel, personnel to invoke, we have come up with some data center um, architectures that you can use to protect your information from a disaster. So we have three architectures that we're going to look at. And the first one is an active, active, an active, active data center architecture. So an active, active data center architecture is one where we have got a duplicate or a copy of the same system at two different data centers. These two data centers to be uh, in completely different geographical locations so that if one um, if a disaster occurs in one geographical location, for example, there could be a power outage in Harare, uh, a power or um, a flood in another city or something else like that happening. If something happens within one city, it should not affect the other system that are in another city. So with active copy of each system in a different city. So if this city goes down, if data center B goes down for some reason, then since we have a copy of everything here sitting in data center A, then we can continue functioning normally as if nothing happened from data center A. So that's the advantage of active active planning, of the active active planning that it reduces or eliminates downtime. So where you're supp where if something goes down here, you're supposed to take five days to bring it up. If you have got a copy or a duplicate in a different data center, then if data center B goes down, then the system can come up in data center A in less than a minute or so. So this is usually automated active active plan where the failover or the flow tolerance is automatic such that if one, um, if the system cannot operate from a certain system, it automatically starts operating from another data center. Then we've got the active standby plan, which is more like the active active plan, but the main difference is with the active standby is your system is has got a copy in two different uh, data centers, but it's only working in one data center. So if the if uh, it goes down in data center A, which could be the active um, data center, then you have to either manually or at times automatically fail over to the standby data center, which is data center B. So all your traffic, when everything is normal, is being handled by data center A. In the event that there is an outage or a problem, then all your traffic is rerouted to data center B. But with an active active plan, that is not that, will, that is not usually the case. With an active active plan, all the traffic is being shared across the two data centers. So both of them are servicing traffic at the same time. But with an, with an active standby uh, scenario, traffic is being is being handled by one data center until that data center goes down. Then it's being it's, it will be rerouted to the next data center. Then we have uh, the data replication plan where we are basically trying to copy all the data that is in the in, in data center A to data center B. But what we do is instead of, instead of building a, a similar infrastructure, all we are doing is transferring the data that is 
data storage block level or a storage blocks level where we are just moving the information at storage level to that side. Then we build manually the infrastructure on top of that data. So with data replication, we're basically sort of coming up with a backup of our data, and then we are trying to restore the data to a different um, site. Other disaster recovery solutions that we've come up with. Um, okay, so we need to differentiate between high availability and disaster recovery. Okay, so high availability is where we want to make sure that our system has no downtime at all. So with high availability, we want to make sure that we have got 100% uptime water. We want to make sure that our system is working at any given moment. Now with disaster recovery, we are saying in the event that a disaster happens, how can we quickly recover our systems? So disaster recovery is not trying to make sure that we have got our systems having 100% uptime, but it's just trying to make sure that when a disaster happens, we can get our information or we can restore our systems back to normalcy in the shortest time possible. So that's the difference between the two. One wants uh, uptime always, the other one wants to make sure that if a disaster happens, we can recover from that disaster, no matter how long it will take us. So some of the um, strategies that can be used for high, high availability could be clustering, for example, database clustering, where you make sure that um, you have two databases that could be in different locations, but they are in the same cluster such that they are sharing the same information. So if one database goes down, the other one in the other location keeps going. Then I've got synchronous mirroring, where you just make sure that you've got two copies of each system in different locations. And there's also a replication, where you make sure that data from one center is being replicated or is being transferred to another center. Then disaster recovery also uses replication, where you're copying information from one center to another for storage or for backup. Then you've got asynchronous mirroring, where you're um, creating similar copies of, of one system in different locations, but you're not doing it at real time. So you could be creating these similar copies after every 20, 24 hours. So you sync the information after there is a lag of any, anything from an hour, 24 hours, two days, one week, one month. It's all up to you. Then there's log shipping, where you move some of the log files or the files of the system to another location so that in the event that you want to restore that system, you just take those uh, backed up files and use them to this place. Then there's also storage area network replication, where you're just restoring your, your storage. Then there's also virtualization replication, which is more or less the same as sun replication, except maybe it will be at a virtual machine level or at virtual network level. So the key activities that we need to keep in mind as we do our business process, uh, business continuity planning process, that we need to make sure that we keep we we create and update our business continuity plans. We make sure that we have the latest information for everybody. We test our plans. We make sure that we have got our best personnel working on this <clears throat> on the plan. We have got different working um, work arrangements that we can invoke in the event of a disaster. Then we have got emergency management procedures and we make sure that we have got a we have everything that we need basically in a in place for example you could need a disaster kit if uh, it's a disaster prone area so thank you for listening to this video on business continuity planning and i hope you've learned something helpful